ladies, gentlemen, friends, both new and old, welcome to this Fuds on Film podcast. I am Scott Morris, and I'm joined today by my good friend, Craig Eastman. Give these people air! <laughs> Again, our competition still stands. Just write in on Twitter. I, I do actually know that one for once, so I make a difference. <laughs> and, of course, relevant to the matter at hand, because today uh, we're going to be talking about a Philip K. Dick adaptation, specifically a Scanner Darkly and Radio Free album. Now... On this podcast, we love a bit of Nick. Philip K is pretty much a favourite author. Just get it out of the way now. You know what's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> I think one of our favourite authors, and certainly some of our favourite films have been based on his work, and we've already spoken about a few of them in podcasts past him, Blade Runner and Total Recall, which we very much admire, but it's fair to say that they are films based only very loosely on Philip K. Dick's Ooh. work. Uh, that inspired them. So we thought we would take a look at two films rather more adherent to the source material, uh, Richard Linklater's 2006 adaptation of A Scanner Darkly and 2014's Radio Free Album, directed by John Allen Simon. And as usual for these episodes, spoilers abound, so consider yourself warned. Yeah! I, I think I was right in saying that. You're you're certainly a, a pretty big Philip K. Dick fan, aren't you? I, I love me a good lengthy bit of dick. <laughs> <laughs> actually, well, it's the, shorter material, actually, actually, it's actually it's. We'll, we'll talk about about that later when I talk about Albemuth. But I do actually prefer a shorter bit of Dick. Um, <laughs> I prefer a, a short form. Yes, a Philip Kindred Dick effort in a literary sense. But I think what's interesting about these two films is that they are adaptations of works that came uh, much later in his career. Quite. Uh, a, a short period before he passed away actually and a period of his writing which is deemed a lot more difficult in terms of how one would go about translating it to fit the screen and I think we will see that we have two directors here of vastly differing capability who have achieved vastly <laughs> differing results Yes, um, but I don't know. Is there anything you want to touch on before we start? Do you Not want to so touch? Much, do you want to touch on some Dick? Don't, don't we... I always. I probably should point out. Um, I, I do like Philip K. Dick's works, but I've not mm. read them all. And specifically, well, I have read *A Scanner Darkly* and, and enjoyed mm. it quite a lot. I've never touched *Radio Free Album*, and uh, I hadn't really quite taken into uh, account some of the. Yeah. Some of the things that happened with, in Philip K. Dick's life towards the yes. end, where he had certain things happened, which I guess we'll, we'll touch on that later. But uh, mm. uh, certainly, both of these works are based, or perhaps not based, but certainly draw heavily on his experiences. So they're perhaps both slightly, not exactly autobiographical, but there's mm. elements of that that he's he's drawing from. So they both seem to be quite personal works, and it's interesting to see how that's been treated on the big screens. Indeed! Let's start with A Scanner Darkly. This adaptation sees Keanu Reeves take the role of Bob Arctor, a man with many faces, at least when he is wearing his anonymizing scramble suit to report to his similarly anonymous superior officers in his role as an undercover cop. He is currently investigating the sourcing and suppliers of a drug that's gripped this dystopian future, Substance D, or Death as it's occasionally known. And while one assumes there's some pleasure to be taken from D, we only ever seem to see the damage that it's wrought. For example, let's take a look at Rory Cochran's Charles Freck, who's busy hallucinating immense quantities of aphids and obsessively cleaning himself. <laughs> and from a lot of what's said, he's still one of the better off. With, we're told, something like 20% of the American populace wired to the eyeballs on this substance, the closest thing there is to help for these people is a chain of rehab centres run by The New Path, who try and clean these people up for a return to society, even if the right and left hemispheres of their planes are no longer talking to each other. Arctor is currently working on Winona Ryder's Donna, his sort of girlfriend and small-time dealer, with the hope of working his way up the chain. His once pleasant home is now occupied not by his long-left wife and children, but by Robert Downey Jr.'s paranoid, hyperactive, would-be scientist in the wall James Barris, and Woody Harrelson's much more laid-back Ernie Luckman, a seemingly nice guy who's a lot more closer to the stoner washout stereotype than is perhaps comfortable. Things become more confusing for actor when, as a result of a tip-off from Barris, he is ordered to start paying particular attention to the suspicious Bob Arctor character. When the future police say anonymous, they mean anonymous. So, <laughs> he manoeuvres everyone out of the house to look for some fancy surveillance setup to be installed to better investigate himself. Now, there are of course any number of undercover investigators in film that wind up identifying more with the people they're investigating than their colleagues or their superiors. Unfortunately for actor, the disassociative disorders that Substance D causes makes it rather difficult for Arctor to identify with anyone, particularly when he starts watching sequences and recordings that he has no memory of. And 
So it goes, with Arctor becoming more paranoid and less capable over time until his superiors decide he's been getting a little too close both to the addicts that he's investigating and also the drugs that he's been taking to fit in with them, and he's best off at a new path facility, which, it turns out, has been Donna's plan all along, suspecting that New Path is the main producers of Substance D, but they've been protected for some reason by the government and have developed great techniques for rooting out undercover swaps. So, once she's unveiled as Bob's superior, she hopes to have a true addict shipped off to the place, which seems to be the only way to break through New Path's security, and they just hope that there's enough left of Bob Actor at the end of New Path's psychological breakdown to gather and return some evidence to them. It is a desperate plan, and frankly not one that holds up to a lot of scrutiny, particularly on repeat viewing. Thankfully, while the narrative is engaging, it's not really the main peg that the film is hanging its hat on. In terms of fidelity, certainly up until Bob shipped off to the New Path Centre, Linklater adheres pretty close to the spirit of the source material. It's not a literal translation, because you don't have five hours to spend on it, and at any length you'd still never get Dick's wonderfully evocative descriptions of mental states and the like. From memory, it's been a little while since I read the book, but it's uh, a bit easygoing on some of the extreme New Path procedures that should perhaps be in the final act, but I suspect that Linklater was trying to get through that section as quickly as possible. On a number of levels, it feels very much like this film ends just after it's revealed that Donna is the superior officer the actor's been reporting to throughout the film, and the remainder of the narrative is perhaps given quite short shrift. But such is the nature of successful adaptations, and I'd argue that this is the most successful of the Philip K. Dick adaptations, at least in sense of being mm. adaptations. We've already described their affection for Blade Runner and Total Recall in prior podcasts, but as I mentioned earlier, there's not really much of the no. original work in those films, and this captures much more of Dick's excellent original novel and is all the richer for it. One aspect of the film that could see it written off as a gimmick was the rotoscoping of the actors to make this an animated film, and I hope that mentioning this so late in the review belays that somewhat, because I don't think it's even no. remotely relevant to the main strengths of the film. However, it has created a truly distinctive looking film, and enabled some scenes of hallucinations and the scramble suit effect that I doubt the sub-$10 million budget could have hoped to achieve as live action. Uh, it just looks terrific, and it looks every bit as good today as it did 10 years ago. The performances are all top class, and Reeves, who always takes more stick than I think is deserved, gives a layered and convincing central performance, and the supporting cast are all top-notch, perhaps overshadowed by Downey Jr.'s hyperactivity, which may, perhaps, just possibly be drawing from his own experience. <laughs> who can say? Who can say? Yeah. But it certainly adds an introduction into Dick's recurring themes of identity and his personal experiences with drugs, this would be a really excellent starting point and a good guide into whether or not you'll appreciate his novels. There's not a great deal more that an adaptation can do, really. It's an excellent film and it's certainly one of my favourites. Greg, what do you make of it? I like it very much and it is one of my favourite Dick adaptations for the reason that you mentioned, Scott, it stands out very much as being the best literal uh, or as close to literal translation from the text to yeah. the screen of his works. As you pointed out, and as I'll touch on when we talk about Albemuth, generally speaking, the more successful Dick adaptations have essentially been strip-mined for their ideas and yeah. the rest cast aside because certain aspects of his work are not great fortes of his primarily sort of character and dialogue and some of the philosophy that he has a tendency to uh, sidetrack himself with and make it very difficult to lift things literally. So you have yeah. movies like Blade Runner and Total Recall, which you've picked the two best examples there and the two which I have picked out also to show that quite often the most successful way to deal with Dick's work is to take that central uh, tenet, that core idea, and adapt it to a much more cinematic uh, narrative. So yeah. Scanner Darkly was a real surprise. I, I went into it with some trepidation because I knew beforehand, I mean, I, I, when did I last, I last saw, I last watched this um, four or five years ago now, I want to say. What year was it released in? 2006. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think the first time I saw it was when it first was released onto the rental market, and I approached it with some trepidation. As a fan of Phil Dick's works, I felt obliged to watch it, but knowing beforehand that it was a more faithful translation, I had my concerns about it. And fortunately, in stark contrast to Radio Free Albemuth, not to, not to give the game away at this early stage, <laughs> Richard Linklater is a director who has clearly got the skills to pay the bills and who you can it probably belongs to a select group of directors who you would entrust that material to um in producing some sort of viable cinematic birthing of uh, of dick's uh, prose so yes 
A Scanner Darkly, I can't really recommend it highly enough. I know, like you say, that visual hook will either draw people in immediately. You have to imagine that people who love cinema are primarily visual people. So I'd hope it wouldn't put a lot of people off, but I know that a lot of people were because they just looked at it and said, oh, it's a cartoon. But it, it most assuredly is not. I would hope that if people are fans of previous Dick adaptations and they have perhaps shelved this or put it in the back burner because the visual style of it, they found it off-putting. I, would, I can only echo what you said. It's not something that you should let interfere with your intentions to watch it. It is reasonably well in service of the plot in terms of the theme of the, you know, the drug addiction and the psychosis that runs throughout the film. But it... I want to say it goes some way to, it goes some way to, it'll sound, does it sound silly to say lighten the mood? It's, it, it perhaps helps carry the film through some of the more challenging moments and some of the ideas and philosophy, I'll keep using that word philosophy, some of the ideas and philosophy that maybe some other, you know, some casual viewers might otherwise find a bit weighty. It's so striking visually and more so now than I think when I saw it first in terms of, I mean, obviously now that we have access to high def transfers, if anything, it looks better than it did when I first watched it on DVD 10 years ago or whatever it was. So, yeah, the the visual thing services the plot somewhat, but it's also a very effective way of carrying the audience through some of the slower or more weighty moments that might put some viewers off, I suppose. So, very visually appealing, although that's not necessarily, I don't know if that was necessarily the intention, uh, it's not material which shouts visual appeal. It's a remarkably accomplished work when you consider the source material that it's been adapted from and how terribly awry this could have gone. All credit to Linklater. I think it's, in literal uh, terms, it is the most successful adaptation of a Philip Dick work I have seen because it's difficult to count the likes of Blade Runner and Total Recall as true adaptations per se. So yeah. if you're measuring it by those criteria, then yes, this is by far and away the most successful and most rewarding Dick adaptation. And it ends on a suitably, pleasantly non-committal tone and note that you don't get all that often. What, am I, what the f*** am I trying to say? Yeah, it's good. Watch it. If you've been thinking about watching <laughs> it and you, you haven't got round to it yet, watch it. Or else I'll come round. Was that a threat? Or you just, <laughs> you'll just come round? I'll just come round. <laughs> Let's take it whichever way you want. If you want it to be a threat, if you're into that, then yeah, all right. But maybe you just want me to come around and give you a hug or sit next to you on the sofa and watch it with you. That, that's cool. <laughs> it is just a really good film and it's one I enjoy heartily. Um, Link later is the director I kind of blow hot and cold on. Yes, her. very much. I think I was turned off at an early age because the first stuff that I saw of his was uh, in my think, unique career. It was <laughs> Dazed and Confused someone, or something. Someone was very happy about showing Dazed <laughs> and Confused almost endlessly in Slackers. Not unsurprisingly enough, they were stoners themselves and hmm. I found it terrible. I just a little bit childish. Like that film yeah. at all. It's just garbage. Yeah. He went to my back burner so I can't remember I think it was a bit of a, a revelation when I saw Scanner Darkly because it might have been the first film of his that I'd actually seen so I mm. saw quite a bit a few bits to kind of go back and uh, maybe uncover some of the rest of his career but yes it's, it's a really good film and this deserves to be seen if you've any interest at all and uh, it doesn't even need to be science fiction um, no it, it's just a, a great investigation to psychological thriller more than anything mm. else and it just looks really fantastic it's a very good film yeah, um, there are conspiratorial aspects to it there's state interference there's, there's state control, all the sort of very familiar themes to anyone who's read Dick's work, but presented in a different way. And the source material is, I mean, generally regarded as being one of his best works. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're going to pick one to work from, that's not a bad choice, let's put it that way. Yes, and it isn't perfect, and I think it, it does pull through some quibbles that I have with it from the, the original source material, but that's perhaps not worth criticising it from. It's certainly not something you would notice on first time, but as I say, that the plan that they've got for trying to uncover the new path is... Ludicrous. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the, the, the idea that even if it was successful, that anything would be done given that it, the only way this could possibly have happened is if it's by government support. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, I'm not sure if uh, one small podunk uh, police department would be able to do a hunch about it if, if they thought they had proof, which would be one crushed blue flower that was smuggled out in a shoe of Bob Actor. I don't think that would fly. It's by no means perfect, but I don't think that is really the thrust of the film. The narrative is there, but it's more just to give the characters a bit of an excuse to kind of have a breakdown in, and that's that's really what makes the film so interesting. So, yes, fantastic film and very much worthy of your attention. And notable also for being, I think, the second movie from that period, uh, the Phoenix-like resurrection of Robert Downey Jr. Yes. Um, this was, I can't remember, I think I might have seen, although it was released later, I think I saw this before, 
before Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Okay. And I, 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 one of my abiding memories of my first view of this is like, oh yeah, isn't Robert Downey Jr. really great when he's not coked off his head <laughs> and, yes. and imploding? Anyone with an interest in uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s resurrected career trajectory kind of needs to check this and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang out. I suspect they might have seen Kiss Kiss Bang Bang already, but I think they're possibly less likely to have seen A Scanner Darkly and you really do need to check it out. If Downey Jr. is your bag. And why shouldn't he be your bag? It's a very nice bag. Indeed. Indeed. He's a bag for life. A baggy for I'd life, pay six. I'd pay six pence for Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> I know we don't want to, but shall we talk a bit about Radio Free Albemuth? I suppose we must. Yes. I might, I'll probably end up covering a lot of uh, a lot of the same ground here in terms of setup, Scott, but um, safe to say Philip Dick was primarily an ideas author, and over an undulating history of works, he committed those ideas to the page with varying degrees of success. Personally, I generally prefer his short story collections over his long-form works, as those represent the best distillation of said ideas, with less of the meandering hippie philosophy and cumbersome dialogue that were never Dick's strong points, and which became increasingly turgid in later publications. It's probably odd, then, that one of my favourite Dick works is Radio Free Albemuth, a posthumously published novel that had been cast aside, presumably, as a first draft, and many believe its core philosophy retooled to form the Valus trilogy. The story concerns Nick Brady, a vinyl record store assistant in the early 80s who comes to believe he has been chosen as the vessel for revolutionary messianic messages from an extraterrestrial entity he labels (laughs) Valus, as you do. The America in which Nick lives is an altered reality where fascism has slowly spread its roots throughout society, spearheaded by President Fremont, a composite Richard Nixon slash Joseph McCarthy figure who has remained in power for some four terms now on the back of a rigged voting system. Fremont pushes his agenda through a message of fear, waging war against a possibly imaginary communist organisation known as a Ramcheck, and propagating a nationalist sentiment that looks awfully prescient in the wake of Donald Trump's current presidential <laughs> campaign. Uh, Valis, we learn, is from the distant star system of Albemuth, from whence the race who seeded Earth take a kindly interest in our progress, and slowly unveils its plan for Nick through a series of visions that we learn are being beamed to him from an alien satellite in the wee hours of the morning. Keep paying attention, guys. Stay with me. These visions assume an increasingly Christ-like tone as they convince Nick of a cosmic master plan to save the human race from destruction that causes him to uproot his family to Los Angeles, where he becomes a successful music executive, leveraging his position to enact a plan that involves using subliminal messages hidden within popular songs to hopefully enable a social revolution. The interesting thing about Albemuth is that Dick himself appears as Nick's best friend and confidant. Anyone familiar with Dick's history, and Scott, you touched on this previously, will know that in this instance, Nick is essentially an outlet for the author's own belief that, by this advanced stage of his drug-addled existence, he had some messianic alternate ego of his own, and many of his own experiences and visions manifest directly through those of Nick in the novel. Dick, of course, asserted that doctors had told him no impact had ever been made on his brain (laughs) by his prodigious commitment to amphetamines and hallucinogens. (laughs) But why... (laughs) But while I have no doubt whatsoever that the author believed that conversation had taken place, I leave it to you to decide whether or not that was actually the case. If I remember correctly from some article I read years ago, he claimed that the doctors told him that his liver had metabolised all of the drugs before they'd had a chance to affect his head. Which which I'm kind of be... (laughs) Which would make taking those drugs kind of defeatist in the first place, but uh, hence hence a lot of my scepticism on that, that claim. This is, after all, a man who, by the time of his death, was adamant he was living on at least two separate historical timelines, in one of which he was a Christian persecuted at the hands of the Roman Empire. <laughs> Hopefully that gives you some idea of how complex a novel Albemuth is, and how carefully one has to sort the interesting ideas from the frankly baffling pseudo-religious tosh to enjoy it. There are few original ideas within, Rather, Dick recycled many of his familiar alternate history slash fascist government tropes in service of what may well have been some sort of emotional catharsis on his own part. But the fact that it is a voyeuristic window in the mind of an author rapidly imploding into his own tangled network of synaptic spasms is one of the reasons I enjoy the novel so much more than most other fans of Dick's work. It's also a pretty good indicator of how silly it would be to want to translate this, a novel Dick himself dismissed despite his willingness to embrace Space Disneyland to film without having an awful lot of experience in such matters. An awful lot of experience. Step forward then, first time director slash writer slash producer John Allen Simon, who, either through hubris, naivety, 
drug use of his own or some heady concoction of all three, <laughs> took some seven years and one cardio resuscitating Kickstarter campaign to get Radio Free Albemuth to our VODs. Jonathan Scarf, who is Nick? <laughs> Shea Wiggum, him off Boardwalk Empire, is Dick. And um, Alanis Morissette is <laughs> Sylvia, another Valus enabled messenger for a ram check who helps our two protagonists to realise that they are in fact just part of a much bigger enlightened network of social radicals and that President Fremont may actually have a much different agenda than the one so far assumed. Now, one of the reasons that the most successful Dick adaptations see Blade Runner Verhoeven's Total Recall, as we've discussed, uh, have thrived, is that they've taken the central idea of Dick's relevance works and stripped away pretty much anything else in service of a much more cinematic narrative that may fleetingly pay deference to the source, but otherwise uh, very much forge their own worlds within which the action can play out. John Allen Simon has pretty much hung himself out to dry here by biting (laughs) off far more than he can chew. With an undeniably ambitious attempt at adapting Albemuth, doggedly translating Dick's meandering philosophy and uber-expositional dialogue directly to the screen. Um, In fairness, the cast mostly do well with the hand that they've been dealt, but it is a pretty (laughs) shitty hand, you must understand. Despite Wiggum's particularly valiant attempt at embodying the orchestrator of all this chaos, none of them managed to break free from the heavy shackles of the author's frankly bad discourse. Isn't it ironic, don't you think, that Morissette is perhaps the most effective? Her naturalistic delivery and relative lack of experience proving one of the more effective ways of skimming over such alternately baffling and frustrating material. (laughs) It's not that there isn't a good movie to be made of Albemuth, it's just that it has very little to do with the novel, and it needs a huge amount of editorial consultation if it's to be tackled by someone who isn't already firmly entrenched and experienced within the medium. See Richard Linklater. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and take a punt here, Scott, and say that on this occasion, I am absolutely confident that you're going to agree with that assertion. <laughs> yes, I'm a little conflicted about it, but only very, very slightly conflicted. I did, as it turned out, reasonably enjoy the film as it's going along. The narrative is not the sturdiest thing to build upon, but I've not read the source material, so it suckered me in because I wanted to see where it was going with all this nonsense. And that, for me, sustained it to the end of the film. But I think it's fair to say that, objectively, it is a bad film. (laughs) Mm. I mean, as you say, performances aren't bad, but flat in places. The narrative Mm. and world building is significantly worse compared to Scanner Darkly. Both films have their problems with believability, but Linklater pretty much managed to minimise them and Albemuth goes in quite the opposite direction. Yeah. I mean, the, the conspiracy theory at the heart of Albemuth is an order of magnitude dafter than Scanner Darkly, which is not enough to write the film off by itself, but the treatment given to Nick's visions from Valis are just <laughs> so abysmal it's just thought was deliberate. Uh, it's, it's the worst looking sort of Sunday afternoon <laughs> TV movie kind of. <laughs> Sort of crossed with what I imagine like a Scientology promotional <laughs> video might look like. I don't I don't know. What got me is that each one is shown in a completely different and equally amateurish style. And just <laughs> that alone just drags the surrounding territory down to laughing stock level. And I mean the strange thing I think is that the rest of the production design's perfectly competent. I mean it's not it's, it's not something fine. to dream about, but it's perfectly acceptable. No. And then you get these abominations that would embarrass an amigo demo disc from the late eighties. And if they <laughs> if they just picked one style and ran with it. I think it would make a bit more sort of stylistic sense and be a bit more excusable. Uh-huh. I mean, like it's not a film with a major studio backing or much of a budget, obviously, but these mishmash of horrendous CG travesties are just repellent and really expose the, the shortcomings of the film rather than hide it. So, yes, uh, it, it makes it difficult to actually recommend. And also, there doesn't seem to be much in the way of thematic content to this. It's hard to say, again, because I've not read the source material, but mm. there's no particular exploration of the character's personalities or their drives no nope. and i'd assumed at the outset that if these these were actually hallucinations these visions which but when you reveal so early on that no actually it's uh, instructions from a, uh, an alien satellite becomes a bit less interesting especially when no one apparently has any interest in what these aliens are like, no <laughs> you think it would come up once <laughs> or twice is <laughs> no no and not honestly the novel does nothing to nothing to flesh that out it is a pretty a pretty doggedly faithful translation in most respects including that one yes how, how blase uh more aliens 
I'll just add them to my queue. Not Uh, again. No more aliens. So, yeah, as I say, as a fan of Dick's work and not having read the source material, I did get some joy out of it, which is, I'm I'm going to guess that the the novel is a more rewarding experience than this film, because how could it not be? Um, (laughs) But yeah, for anyone who's read the book, or for anyone who's on the fence about Dick's work, this is a film to run a mile from. Yes. All too obvious why this, like the work that it was based on, was shelved, and perhaps that's where it would have been best left. Indeed. Yeah, it's just a bit of an embarrassment, really, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, if you want to fast track a scanner darkly, then you probably want to. Uh, no, I was going to say something really horrible there, which is, like you say, it's not in terms of production. It's not a. It's not a terrible, terrible effort. And John Allen Simon, bless him. I watched this and I almost wanted to go and give him a hug because I kind <laughs> of appreciate what he wanted to do. I'm just baffled as to why. I mean, I'm assuming for the guy to want to take this project on as writer, director, and producer, he must have some passion for the source material. Yes. Right? Or some close tie dicks. So he must be familiar. I mean, I I really like the novel Radio Free Albemuth. As I say, it's one of my favourite dicks, but I make that statement acknowledging that that's a very subjective liking on my part. I know that that objectively is nowhere near one of Dick's best works. Yeah. And that, as I say, the fact that Dick himself shelved it at a period in his life where he thought he was Jesus. <laughs> um, do you know what? <laughs> in an alternate timeline, <laughs> then yeah, that, that says something about the quality of work. So why someone, you know, knowing how notoriously difficult it is to faithfully adapt Dick's work, and it's surprising given how prolific a writer he was through that, you know, the, the first and middle periods, especially, if I remember correctly, of his career, he was that we haven't seen more adaptations of um, a lot of those short story works and whatnot. And that is primarily because even those short stories, not easy to adapt. Mm-hmm. So why you would choose arguably the most difficult work to try and adapt for the screen as your first project <laughs> as a writer, director and producer baffles me the guy uh, the guy must have a just a some sort of crazy passion for it for some reason we can only imagine i must read more about john allen simon i'm going to make the assumption at this point that he's incredibly mentally unbalanced <laughs> but it kind of makes me want to go and give the guy throw my arms around the guy and go listen i kind of appreciate that you tried and it, it's not all terrible when we talk about the performances i feel like the caveats i put the caveat in there that i genuinely feel like most of the actors with the exception of one or two do the best they can, and when we say about the performances falling flat, it's one of those occasions where it's it's really not the actor's fault. It genuinely, genuinely is the material they're working with. Because Dick's dialogue is uh, in his novels, and here it's a literal translation. I think literally a lot of this dialogue is lifted off the page. Dick's dialogue in his books is usually, he's more interested in it in service of, it is, it's purely expositional. It's not often all that character building so much as most other authors, and that that in itself, if you're going to do that, if you're going to translate that literally, that does not translate to the cinematic medium at all. So, like I said, there's there's got to be a movie in here of the ideas, or you know, a two three part TV series. Because Man in the High Castle, I wouldn't have wanted to try and tackle that necessarily as a two hour movie. But look what a success um, Amazon. Yeah. Uh, made of it um, in the 10 part TV series uh, not TV series, um, on demand series so um, I feel like if you were going to tackle Albemuth you would have to do something similar to that but even someone as accomplished as Linklater uh, you're still taking a gamble if you want to take on board all of those tasks yourself you need someone to editorialise for you. you you probably want if you're that close to the source material you probably want someone else to step in and say, okay, well, here's my opinion of what you need to chuck out from this because you're you're too close to it almost. And somewhere in there, there is a, a compelling narrative. It's just that it's not, as I say, the novel, and it's certainly not the novel crammed into two hours. Yeah, the, the narrative would have to be significantly altered to this to make any sense. Uh, yeah. Pro- I did some reading on John Allen Simon earlier. He's uh, the boss of a distribution company who I think handled the stateside distribution of stuff like The Wicker Man and some other kind of somewhat more quirky films, that, that sort of thing. But this, yeah, it's, it's wow. a, an ambitious first project to take on. No actual on-the-ground experience. I, I guess he might have been around for some of this stuff. But yeah, um, it's a tough one to start with. And yeah, uh, I don't think it's worked 
all that well. Well, what I'm terrified to see now is that another one of my favourite dick novels is Flow My Tears, The Policeman Said. Mm -hmm. And that's been mooted several times, I think, for production. I think it's been optioned once or twice. And it looks like he's currently <laughs> he is currently developing it as we as we speak. <laughs> um, so that fills me with a bit of dread because there you go. That's unless he's learned an awful lot from uh, from Albemuth, then that's two of my favourite Dick novels that are potentially about to get trashed. But um, <laughs> yeah, I almost want to say it's um, it's like a super brave attempt, but a really really fundamentally misguided one from the from the very inception. So. Yeah, one of those movies, I think the story of which is probably far more compelling than uh, than the movie itself. So the story of the production of which. Yeah, as I sort of alluded to, it was, it was finished in 2010 and then it sat on a shelf for four years uh, mm. because I think, understandably, no one particularly wanted to dispute it. Uh, the, as you mentioned, the Kickstarter campaign could, did get it out to, to the video on demand. But I think it's safe to say it's not made much of an impact for perfectly understandable reasons. It it's, did get a theatrical release and garnered something like $5,500 in the States, Scott, so... Mm. Well, there we go. <laughs> what more can you, you know say? I mean? Big money. Yeah, big prizes. I love it. <laughs> but I just say, I don't. I feel bad. I feel bad beating up this film because it's. I think it's tried. I feel like its heart is in the right place. It wants to be so uh, reverential to the work, but I think it's just the wrong approach in this instance. And yeah, they've not had the. Well, in, in particular, they've not had the CG moxie to figure through on the the. Uh, I know I keep coming back to that, but if those hallucination sequences, those uh, valus sequences, had just been just a bit better or more consistent this would not have seemed like such a silly film but that's the end what it's reduced mm -hmm. to it's just come across as, as being a very silly work and that's not fair on everything that's around it because everything else is yeah. reasonably competent but there's just this gaping hole in the middle of it that's sinking everything around it and it's just a bit unfair really what cracks me up is that you could have saved yourself i mean as terrible as those sequences are one assumes part of the budget at least went on them <laughs> yes. um you could have saved yourself budget time in the edit by simply not including those scenes and showing the character waking up at 3am in a state yeah. of whatever and you know enlightenment or something and then explaining to someone else what the vision was yeah. without actually trying to construct it visually on screen yeah. um, particularly when and they, having it they had no way aid explanation of what's going on so there's no point no. to them anyway you still needed to have that to explain what was going in them so yeah, yeah and typically as I say the dialogue is so exposition heavy that essentially all that happens is Nick goes and explains exactly what happened <laughs> in his vision to someone immediately afterwards anyway yes um, so yeah it's, it's it's really odd that you would opt to go down that route of what looks like, you know, mid mid to late nineties uh, sci fi channel <laughs> own production sort of level effects work. So it's like, like you say, someone someone sitting at home with an Amiga and a video toaster, <laughs> yeah. really really pleased with you know as the smoke as the black <laughs> smoke pumps out of the thing, really 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 pleased with what they've achieved on such a a, a low a low budget on such a low processor overhead. <laughs> but yeah, just crazy just crazy and misguided so i mean if nothing else we've given you one film to appreciate and one film to not appreciate one dire warning to avoid so you know there's there's been some value from this podcast i think certainly if you're a philip k dick fan embrace a scanner darkly and uh, reject <laughs> radio v album i think that will do it for today Unless there's anything else you'd like to bring up? I don't think there is, Scott. What will we be discussing next? Well, we'll be having a bit of a free-form discussion on whatever we happen to see at the cinema. Um, assuming I actually see something at the cinema. We will be back with you with whatever we wind up seeing, or hopefully getting something on catch-up on the 20th. But uh, until that time, I have been Scott Morris, and I bid you adieu, and I hope Craigie Spin will do so too. I certainly shall. Adieu! Adieu!